For those of you who have been hearing me talk about ERVs, energy recovery ventilators, for a number of years on this channel, this is one that I am particularly excited about. Uh, I've been referring this to a lot of my clients lately, and it's because it's got some technology in it that is pretty much where the future of ventilation in general is gonna go. It has a brain, which is this little uh, bump out on the side of it here. This thing on the bigger models of this Brone AI series actually is powerful enough that it's gonna have its own cooling fan built in specifically for the circuitry because it's thinking so hard sometimes. So the boxes tend to be kind of cubicle uh, in this line and they go from 110 CFM all the way up to a 230 CFM HRV. I actually don't recommend HRVs because they do not buffer and protect your home from spikes in humidity outside, either really, really dry spikes or really, really wet spikes. An HRV will not protect you and your family or your home's durability from that. Uh, and so you don't want that. Panasonic, for example, does not even make an HRV. They, have, they never have. ERV is really where this is going and these guys make a good enough ERV with some protection features in it that I'm gonna explain in this video that I wanted to give you kind of like a full scale uh, how to program this and why programming it gets so hairy. It's perfect for explaining why this gets more complicated than it seems. On the outside, this box solves a lot of problems for a lot of people, mainly because it tests itself twice per second. If you hired a test professional like me to come out, I will test it exactly one time maybe twice if there's something wrong with it and we need to come back. But in general, nobody's gonna do as good a job as this device will do for itself. It's not doing a pressure test or an airflow test. What it's doing is comparing the RPM of the fans with the wattage used. Having something to monitor how well your ventilation is actually working is such a critical part of the ventilation conversation because frankly, a lot of people are gonna let their filters get clogged, which you can see on this channel, and then the ventilation won't work at all and it'll be noisy. There is a smaller model that's slimmer that now has the ability to switch directions, uh, which is very useful because when you actually put this thing down in your crawl space or in your mechanical closet or in your conditioned attic, wherever it's gonna be, and I do recommend that it's a conditioned space, it's, you're gonna have to connect the ducts and that can get kind of complicated because this is, doesn't necessarily make perfect sense. So this is the fresh air from outside. This is the stale air to outside. So the front two, um, if you get the side mount model, they just basically moved these to here. Now, since this is fresh air from outside, diagonally opposite from it is the fresh air to the house delivery. Since this is the stale air to outside, this diagonally from it is the stale air from the house. And they basically just moved all of those from here. So it's not like on the side view, uh, model, this is outside and that is outside. It's actually kind of swapped, which is why I like their new model. That's a, I believe it's a 150 or a 160 model. You can see that on their website. So first thing that we want to um, get into is how to start this up. Now, this is one of the cool things about this unit is it'll tell you what is wrong. So if you turn this on, you can see that the beautiful screen starts uh, glowing. We have a couple of things going on inside of this. First of all, this recirculate uh, flap that's a damper that redirects the airflow from coming from outside to just redirecting and circling back the stale air that's coming from the house and putting it back into the house. And we will get into how you want to deal with that uh, in this video. You have three buttons on this control. You've got OK right here. You have got plus and minus. If you were to turn this on in the field and it tells you an error. First thing that you always wanna do, if you see one of these in the field, and chances are you might be watching this because you've got one and you're pretty sure it might be running wrong, the, they've got two different kind of codes that you're gonna see on this, warning codes and error codes. Warning codes are W, error codes are E. You wanna be able to look at those. You wanna do a visual inspection of the thing. And there's an image inside of the uh, installation manual of how you do not want this to look then you want to do a hard reset. The first thing that I'm gonna teach you is how to do the hard reset. So this button, the okay button, and the minus button held down together for four seconds. It says reset, yes. Then you can say fan is working and it's going to reset itself. So this kind of wipes the options uh, that you had before and you're gonna to want to uh, reset this thing. Probably it wasn't set up the right way and that's one of the things that I just wanna caution everybody. This seems like maybe it's plug and play. While I do love this machine, 
you do need to know how to actually set it up. And so read through the manual. I cannot stress that enough. I'm gonna show you parts of the manual here in this video uh, to just make this a few points, but you just can't replace that. So like, it, even if you were the normal person, who's the homeowner, you wanna know what it's supposed to do because often the HVAC professional might not actually have as good an understanding as you do because you watch this channel. So you can hear the fan really kicking up. It's really trying to reach its max speed. This is the max that I am allowed to generate on this unit. This is 122 CFM. And you can see that the numbers are moving independently of each other. And this is one of the important things about a sophisticated piece of ventilation equipment is it's gonna have EC motors. They are two separate machines inside of here and they're each trying to get to the max. But at some point, it's gonna give us a flashing house symbol. And that flashing house, which side it's on, the incoming or the outgoing, is gonna tell you which side is the most restricted. And that then might be your hint that you need to go and fix something about the installation. Then we can go into min speed instead, and you can hear the fans ramp down. What we used to have to do with ERVs is actually like choke down a damper to get the fans to not work as hard. And so they've come a long way in the last 10 years. So let's go ahead and keep this in standby for right now so that it's not making noise at us. Go into uh, the configuration options. And in order to get into this menu, I'm gonna press and hold for four seconds. Now the first option that we see here is defrost. This is super important. I'm actually glad that they get to it first because the sensor that I pointed out to you that's inside the unit, that's testing the air that's coming into it from outside, is going to be listening for a specific degree. It's 23 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a little below freezing for those of you who are working in C. At 23 degrees, this unit is going to have to do something to protect the core. They're not so much worried about it icing up and then like blocking and then it having to melt again, is that literally you're gonna destroy the core in the middle of this ERV. So we can't let that happen. On an ERV, you don't need to use the condensate drain on the bottom because there should never be any condensation or ice forming. But in order to make sure that that happens, we have two models. So when you look at the model number of your Brone AI series ERV, at the very end, there's either gonna be an R, like RS for a recirculating side unit, which is not the one that we have here. This is an RT, recirculating top mount. There's another one called N, S or NT. The N is just negative, uh, is what it stands, or non-recirculating. So it'll, it'll turn the thing into just an exhaust fan. If it gets so cold that it's like, hey, I can't recover anymore, it'll just say, great, I'm just sending warm air out through my core and we're gonna shut down the supply side at all. Be careful about that. If you have a fireplace, then you don't want the bath exhausts to work at the expense of the supply side. So you either have to deal with the defrost in discretion mode or in plus mode. Discretion mode means it's going to defrost without speed variation. So it's going to uh, keep the same speed no matter what, and then it'll just basically work that recirculating uh, flap to redirect the air so that it takes the incoming air, warms the core back up once it hits that 23 degree Fahrenheit. Plus is an extended version of defrost. And I'll remind you again, recirculating the air, if you're using it as bath exhaust, might be bad for humidity and odors. Um, it is allowed in code, even where recirculating isn't allowed, it's allowed if it's for defrost mode. Now, either one of these options, in my opinion, is like not great. It, it defeats the whole purpose of what we're doing with these machines your responsibility in that case is to make sure that the incoming air never hits 23 degrees. That can mean either that you install this inside the condition envelope with enough incoming uh, duct work. And like, by the way, in my crawl space, what I did is not insulate the incoming duct work. Uh, that means that I could form condensation, but in another video that you will see next week, uh, I don't care about that because my crawl space can get wet and it's not a worry. In fact, I'm actually able to see whether it condenses at all. We live in Atlanta and it doesn't get that cold here. So 22 degrees is about as cold as it ever gets. That's our design day. So when you have assured that this thing will never hit 23 degrees on the incoming side, either through just passive bleed, that's kind of like preheating uh, the air 
through just accidentally having it be inside the condition envelope. Having this machine be inside the condition envelope makes all the metal in this the same temperature as your home, which is also good. That'll go a long way for you. Or worst case, if you're in Alaska or Canada, having a preheater. I don't recommend any particular one, but this is the kind of thing that you have to do if you live there. Your installation options are next. T1 is a fully independently ducted ERV system. Uh, this means that you're gonna run all the exhaust ducts. Generally, like I said, in my client's cases, always we're, we're only using an ERV if we have to because your house is too tight to use bath fans. So if you can't use bath fans, you use this instead. So you're running ducts to all of the bathrooms where the bath fan would have been, and then you're running supply some, to a number of locations, not one location. Don't dump all of the fresh air in one place because then it doesn't have an incentive to like mix. Generally, you wanna pull air out of bathrooms, push air into bedrooms because you know you're gonna be in the bedrooms for at least eight hours a day, hopefully. T2 is half of a duct system. This is what I'm normally recommending to my clients. Uh, T2 means you're gonna run all the exhausts from the bathrooms, just like I described before, but instead of independently ducting the supply, you're just gonna dump the supply air into the return side. The return side is beneficial for two reasons. Number one, the return is already a negative pressure zone, so it's pulling, it's inviting the fresh air to come into the ductwork. Number two, it's generally, if you can hook it up this way, it's gonna be before the filter. You wanna put the filter at the end of the line so that you can actually connect things into your return on the way. That way you get double filtration. These things can come with a MERV 13 optional filter in them, which is right here. And uh, that's nice, but it only grabs like 85% of big particles and only 25% uh, of small particles. So if you can put it immediately through another MERV 13 or even better a MERV 16, that's great. You do want to make sure that you hook this up at least 10 feet away from the air handler. So 10 feet upstream, best case. If you can't do that, there is another option, which is T3. T3 is where you are gonna hook the supply instead of into the return, into the supply trunk of your main air handler unit. Uh, in either of these cases, in my opinion, you wanna make sure that the air handler runs 24 seven, which if you use a Mitsubishi uh, heat pump, they are designed to do that, and you actually have to buy an extra controller if you want it to turn off. So when you put it into auto mode, it'll just run at like a lower speed all the time. That's good for this kind of a setup. All three of those first options, T1, T2, T3, even though they sound great and they sound like exactly what I'm either installing in my own home or recommending to my clients, will allow the recirculate mode to operate. So again, if my responsibility is to make sure that this air coming in never hits 23, I don't care about that. The, the installation options that are left are T4, T5. T4 is a simple return return. If you have an HVAC guy who is like, you found on a billboard, no offense billboard guys, um, who is like, oh yeah, we, we can install these, we do it sometimes. They're gonna come in with some brand that you probably might not have heard of, um, that they sell at the local supply house. And what he's gonna do, unless you specifically ask for something different, is just this simple option, which is pull air out of the return, give air back into the return a few feet away. This is not, in my opinion, not great. If you're gonna throw air away from your house, it would be best if it was the most polluted air we could find in the house, instead of just some air that I was gonna reuse and feed to my children's lungs, but I'm just gonna take it and throw it outside instead. So, eh, it's not like the best, but if that's the best you can do, then that's fine. Again, I will say, just as a reminder, I never recommend ERVs unless you have to have one because you can't use bath fans. In which case, we're not using T4 as an installation option because it just doesn't make any sense. T5 is the last one, and that's basically the same as the simple, but it's instead of plugging from the return and into the return, you plug from the return into the supply. This is actually the hardest one on this piece of equipment because you're pulling air out of a zone where air is already trying to be pulled by a much stronger fan, your air handler. And then you're trying to push air into a duct where air is already being pushed by a much stronger fan. So it's actually probably gonna perform the least well on T5 in real life. Now that being said, I have been told by Brown's uh, technical team, thanks to Travis, that it actually in climate zones one through five, which is most of the US, not counting like Minnesota and real, real north, 
it won't matter which of these you tell this machine you're doing. As long as you have the defrost cycle uh, set up the right way. So if you're, whether you're recirculating or not recirculating and just turning it into an exhaust fan, I think that it's, you can tell it different things and you want to think through all these options. This could end up being an hour long video if I actually got into the weeds on all of the different like side effects that we could have here. But basically all I'm saying is I recommend T1, T2, T3 in real life applications because we have to use it as a bath exhaust. T4, T5, I would use if I wanted to trick this thing into not recirculating if the crap hit the fan at some point and we had that 23 degree thing happen because I still need to use my exhaust. If you have a fireplace in your house, I, I warned you, but uh, at that point, it's gonna probably start backdrafting the fireplace because your house might be so tight that, that that happens. Okay, so let's move past the installation options. Now, the controls. Your next option here is called dry. This is not to do with dehumidification. This is about dry contact control. So if you were to just, a dry contact is just like a light switch or like, I want you to turn on now. So dry contact has four simple modes of operation on this dry contact. And again, this thing will just be operated by an on off switch at that point or a timer. First you have min, then we have max, auto, and we have intermittent. The explanation for these is minimum is just gonna run it at the minimum seed that we set at the very beginning of the menus uh, outside of this uh, configuration. Intermittent runs at minimum speed for 20 minutes and then another set speed that we will set for 40 minutes on the hour. And it could be standby, it could actually shut off for 40 minutes. Now, one of the things that they point out in this is that you want to uh, make sure that if this machine or any of its incoming or outgoing ductwork is in unconditioned space, then you want to run this continuously. Never shut it off, never let it run into intermittent mode, unless it's running a defrost. Auto is based on running the outdoor temperatures. So if it happens to be between 50 degrees and 77 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll run at minimum speed. If it's between 77 and 82, it'll run for 30 minutes on and then half off. It'll run for uh, 20 minutes if it's between 82 and 91. You could see all this in the chart here, but um, I think that this is not how I would run the system unless you had a space that like wasn't occupied a lot of time and you're only using this thing to exhaust from building off gassing. And then max is pretty obvious. So if you turn it on with your timer or your switch or whatever, it'll just automatically run to the max speed. What I would do probably in that case is set your minimum speed to your target ventilation and then have the boost option that you can configure later with a boost button. So minimum speed would actually not be the lowest I would ever wanna run like vacation mode. Minimum would be what my everyday rate would be. And then I would sometimes kick it up to boost. So now moving on to override. Override is how you want this thing to act when things start going wrong. If this finds that one of the streams of air has become so hindered that it's actually starting to affect the airflow, it's run up the fans as hard as it can, and then it basically hits this ceiling where, uh, interestingly, there, it's only allowed to run a certain wattage, and it's probably so that it doesn't start melting circuitry, but um, that wattage is reached. Now you have some options. You have balanced, you have performance, and you have discretion. These are pretty interesting. Balanced means if the incoming air gets clogged, then it will also drop the outgoing air, even though it's not clogged, to just match it so that you keep the incoming and the outgoing streams the same. That's equalizing. I like that because at that point, if my air inside, my air quality starts getting a little stale or something, I'd probably come down here and visit this and say, what's, what's going on with you? Um, at which point I would see the error code and see that one of the houses is flashing when I st started it back up. Discretion means that this device will decide based on uh, what power is available that with that wattage ceiling that we were talking about um, to be able to divvy between the supply and the exhaust to get your home to be ventilated however it can while knowing that it might sacrifice exhaust flow in favor of supply flow or vice versa just kind of depending on what is happening with this thing. So it's using its own discretion at that point. Performance would be what I would advise in an override situation if you really, really had to be sure that the exhausts were working. Performance will actually favor the exhaust side and it will make sure that you're hitting the exhaust numbers that you want even to the point 
and this is very interesting, of letting the supply run down to lower the wattage so that it can actually overdrive the exhaust side. So it'll actually feed it harder than it would even on max speed because it gives itself the room to do that while not overheating the electronics. And last configuration option is intermittent. And this is to do with that setting that we had on the four simple modes of operation if you're using a dry contact uh, control, which is just a simple on off or a timer. So in the intermittent mode, it's gonna again run for 20 minutes on minimum, and then it's gonna do 40 minutes of whatever I set here. And I can set this to be minimum speed also, I can set this to be standby, I can set this to be any number I want to. And the last thing is that there is an info screen on this that will tell us how many watts this thing is actually pulling. That's the info screen that's available when it's running. Now we've reached the extra credit portion of the video. There's a couple things that are, are interesting to note. I'm gonna go ahead and run this thing up to max so that we can do some uh, quick testing of this. The way that you vent this is gonna be very, very important because this is a beautiful machine, but it's only as good as the way that it's installed. What you don't wanna do is take your six inch flex duct and just ram it down on there and let it do whatever it wants. We can see that we've restricted the airflow a ton at this point. And this is, by the way, only a six foot section of, the, here's the other end of it right here, right? So that's not good. Um, we wanna make sure that we have ducted this with hard elbows. That looks like this. And even with that, I am gonna get a very slight drop in this. Now you can imagine what starts happening when we add more ductwork here, and there are gonna be more turns. So what I always suggest, first extra credit thing, is use what's called a six eight reducer, and you wanna put an eight inch duct on that bad boy. Now we can get back up to the regular speed that we were at. An eight inch duct is actually twice the size almost as a six inch duct. So that is gonna make your life a lot easier. This duct system will not affect this. All the runouts to individual bathrooms can still be four inches and to bedrooms if you're doing an independently ducted system. But this is the first thing that I would suggest for almost anybody. Next extra credit is where you take these things that are going to outside. They're probably gonna to wanna to be insulated unless you're like me and you're experimenting with your crawl space. When they go outside, you're gonna to wanna to have a hood on them. Make sure the hood does not have a flap built into it. Make sure the hood has a screen in it that's not gonna allow big bugs to come inside. If you're freaky like me and you wanna go out there and clean them every month, then you can use a finer mesh screen, make sure mosquitoes don't even make it inside. But we had a problem where actually mosquitoes were making it all the way through the things and they were falling dead at the base of my wall over here. The other thing is that you can do what's called a tandem vent or a concentric vent. This is a one vent that you put in the wall so it's one hole and it's gonna be your incoming and your outgoing at the same time. I'm not a big fan of this. And in fact, Brone says in this manual that you only wanna do that uh, in the case of running 110 CFM or less, only if you're gonna use identical velocities, meaning balanced system. If you're gonna try and unbalance this thing, which you would do by pressing the plus and minus at the same time, then you can um, start messing around with this thing. If you want to unbalance the system, you can press plus and minus at the same time and hold it for four seconds. And now you can start playing with one or the other. But I have a video on why that doesn't really make sense because it takes a lot to, to pressurize or depressurize a home to an extent where anyone would notice. When you use these concentric vents, it's worst case scenario only. Again, you're limited by what Brone is, is telling you. And also there is gonna be a cross contamination. They test this, Brone does, and they're allowed per ASHRAE 62.2 section 6.8.4 uh, to have up to 10% contamination between the streams. That sounds like a lot to me. So I would rather, if you can at all work it, have them be 10 feet apart from each other. That's always best. Now, when you're looking at the specs on these, you've got a couple different numbers here. SRE stands for Sensible Recovery Efficiency. That can be listed at a few different points. Hopefully you would get it at the low speed, which they like to tell you, and also at the high speed. That would be great. ASRE is the Adjusted Sensible Recovery Efficiency. That is without the wattage factored in. So it's just like kind of purely what the machine is doing without considering the electrical 
uh, draw on it. And then ASE is the efficiency of the core all by itself. Okay, last things are static pressure. These might seem delicate based on what I have shown you here, um, but just know that Brone and, and other manufacturers as well do test these at like a range, and you've got a fan curve table that's in the spec sheet that you can see. And they test these actually up to an inch and a half of water column of resistance. So they are set up, and the fans these days are powerful enough that they can fight against a pretty good static. That being said, you should try to fix problems in your static pressure in your duct system, which is often about the ducts being too small or too restricted, before you start hooking one of these up to it. Because like, just fix the problems, don't band-aid over them. The last thing is that you have the option for a medium speed, which I think would be helpful here, so that you've got something that's like a target, and then a low like vacation or I'm going away for the weekend mode, and then up to boost mode, if you use their smart control. And that also will enable you to use a different mode called smart mode. And that is a topic for another video because we've talked about this for way too long already. So I hope that this has been interesting to you. I hope that you have not fallen asleep. Uh, if you have one of these and you have had interesting experiences with it, please do comment below and let us know your tips and tricks, anything else that I didn't mention here. And I tried to be pretty exhaustive about this, as you can probably tell. So please do uh, like and subscribe. Tune in next time.